Wow. Aren't we lucky to have heard that original recording of an unknown person smoking an opium pipe in an opium den in London 1571? Eye-opening and mesmeric. Hello, and welcome to the final couplet with me, Theo Cowan. Here we are again. I had a bit of a nightmare today. I tried to move the podcast onto a different podcast hosting website and all of the podcasts disappeared. So apologies to anyone that was trying desperately to listen to a breakdown of one of Shakespeare's first 23 sonnets on a Wednesday morning. I know that's the time when most of my listeners get their Shakespeare fix. So apologies and hopefully I just won't touch the episodes again. I was just trying to be fancy. I was trying to I was trying to do make it make the podcast better and it failed. So now it's just I've just got reverted back to what I was doing before. So the moral of the story is never, ever try something new. Right, enough of that crap. Let's dive in to Shakespeare's 24th sonnet. Sonnet 24. Mine eye hath played the painter and hath steeled thy beauty's form in table of my heart. My body is the frame wherein tis held, and perspective it is best painter's art. For through the painter must you see his skill, to find where your true image pictured lies, which in my bosom's shop is hanging still, that hath his window glazed with thine eyes. Now see what good turns eyes for eyes have done, Mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me are windows to my breast, where through the sun delights to peep, to gaze therein on thee. Yet eyes this cunning want to grace their art, they draw but what they see, know not the heart. Well, that is definitely one of his more confusing ones. On first reading, not a bloody clue what he's talking about. On second reading, also not a clue. On third reading, I haven't read it three times. But look, the whole point of this podcast is to try and work out what the hell Shakespeare is talking about in his sonnets. So we must dive in. However much you hate it. We have to. Right. So we start with, Mine eye hath played the painter, and hath steeled thy beauty's form in table of my heart. So here he's saying, My eye has played the part of a painter, and steeled thy beauty's form in table of my heart. So that sort of engraved or, or painted your beauty, the recipient of the poem's beauty, on the, on the canvas of my Shakespeare's heart. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Then he continues with, My body is the frame wherein tis held, and perspective it is best painter's art. So here he's continuing on the same theme, of course. So he's a painter, and he has painted the beauty of the recipient of the poem's onto his heart. And here he's saying, my body is the frame of that painting. And by the way, perspective is a painter's sort of best skill. That's just a little add on. In case you didn't know, it's actually really hard to do perspective in painting. Just thought I'd let you know that in the sonnet. Then he continues with, for through the painter must you see his skill to find where your true image pictured lies which in my bosom's shop is hanging still, that hath his windows glazed with thine eyes. 
sorry that was such a big segment, but it all sort of rolls into one there. And I think he's saying through the painter, which is him, his eye, you can find the true image of yourself, which is in the bosom of the painter, him. So through the painter, you can find the true image of yourself in his heart, the painter's heart, Shakespeare's heart. And then, that hath his windows glazed with thine eyes. And here I think he's just saying, your, your, your eyes are the windows into my heart. The eyes are the windows to the heart. That's a phrase, isn't it? I think that's what he's saying here. But look, I can't be 100% sure about that. Don't take me to court over it. Now, see what good turns eyes for eyes have done. Here he's just saying, now look what our eyes have done for each other. My eyes done this, your eyes done that. Mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me are windows to my breast, wherein the sun delights to peep, to gaze therein on thee. So here he's saying, my eyes have drawn your shape, and your eyes are windows into which... I can see my heart. I can look at my heart. Also, by the way, the sun has a little look in, which is nice. The delight, the sun loves to have a look in, delights to peep. The peeping sun, creepy little sun. I don't think he meant it to sound creepy. I think it's, we think of peeping as a bit creepy now, but I'm sure back then peeping was just fine. It was just having a look. Now, finally, we've got the final couplet, which is, Yet eyes this cunning want to grace their art. They draw but what they see, know not the heart. And here I think he's basically saying, My eyes lack some skill, actually, and they can't look into your heart. They only draw what they see. So putting himself down at the end there, which is very unlike Shakespeare. He usually bigs himself up at the end. But this one's a bit like, mm, I don't actually have the skill for that. So it's nice to see he's humble. He's humble in Sonnet 24. Right. That was definitely one of the more confusing sonnets. And I still don't fully get what's going on. But I think the long and short of it is he's saying his eyes has the ability to paint the recipient's image onto his heart. But he's not that skillful with his eyes because he can't see the recipient's heart but no one can see someone's heart can they unless of course they have x-ray vision and maybe the idea is that Shakespeare was desperate for x-ray vision at that point to see the heart of his lover I think that's probably what he's getting at so the main takeaway is Shakespeare wishes he had x-ray vision so he could see people's hearts and I'm sure scholars will agree with me on that. Hey, you know what? After hearing me read that and sort of butcher the meaning of it, if you've got a better idea of what it means, how about you tell me? You tell me. And what I'm saying is, get in touch. Drop me a voice note. You can voice note on Spotify now. So if you're on Spotify, you can voice note the creator. And that's me. And maybe, you know... Drop me a voice note and say, no, you bloody idiot. This is what it's on about. This is what Sonnet 24 is about. So I'd appreciate that. And maybe if you're very lucky, I'll play it on an episode. Can you imagine your voice on this soon to be award winning podcast played to what will be an audience of, of millions? So think about that. It's a lovely little prize for you. If you have the meaning of Sonnet 24. Right, I suppose we should put this sonnet to our story, shouldn't we? It's only fair. If you'll remember last week, Shakespeare wrote down Sonnet 23 on a bit of paper and walked onto stage as a character in Romeo and Juliet and gave it to David, who's playing Romeo, to read on stage. So he couldn't not read it. 
very clever, very clever little ploy from Shakespeare. Let's see how that went down and how Sonnet 24 fits in. David finishes reading Sonnet 23. Of course, Shakespeare has left the stage in a puff of smoke. So all David can do is carry on with the play. But he keeps thinking, what the hell was all that? Why did Shakespeare hand me that sonnet mid, mid-show? mid Did he want me to read it to the audience or was it about me? And he was very confused. And he's already a bad actor, isn't he? So the rest of the show was even worse than it normally is. They finally got to the end of the show, much to everyone's relief. And when they got to the bows, Shakespeare came on because, of course, he played a little cameo. And he did a little bow and all the other actors were a bit annoyed that he was taking the limelight. But Shakespeare was soaking it all in. He was he actually quite enjoyed being on stage and he thought, hmm, maybe I'll give myself a little part in my next play. David was glaring at Shakespeare as he bowed and and waved his arms up and down, revving the crowd up like a hype man. Above the cheers, Shakespeare said, Well, did you like the sonnet? to David. And David said, What was all that about? And Shakespeare said, I was trying to express my love. And David said, Wow, it was a weird way of doing it. And Shakespeare said, I'm sorry, I thought it was the only way that you'd actually read one of my sonnets and actually listen. And David said, Yeah, well, it was the only way. Actually, it did work. But the start was weird about bad actors and not being prepared. Was that about me? And Shakespeare said, Oh, no, I didn't mean that to be about you. That was just about generally bad actors, about just about how they need to be prepared and stuff. And David said, Right, okay, because that got me quite worried and I was in my head for the rest of the performance. And Shakespeare said, Yes, uh, I did actually notice that you were worse than normal. And David said, What do you mean the normal? And Shakespeare said, Well, no, not normal. No, you're normally great. You're normally brilliant. You were just a little, you were slightly worse. Not bad, you were just slightly worse. And David said, Let's go off stage and talk about this properly. And Shakespeare said, Give me a moment, I'm loving this crowd. So David stormed off while Shakespeare ran up and down the stage, instigating Mexican waves and got all the audience going, way, way, like that. Eventually, once he has soaked up all the atmosphere and got all the accolades that he wanted, Shakespeare left the stage. He tried to find David. He went up to his dressing room, but David wasn't there. He ran outside onto the street and bumped into Ben Johnson. And Ben said, Shakespeare, I've just come after the show to see old David. And Shakespeare said, well, he's not here. He's gone. And Ben said, well, that's strange. I I was hoping to see him. And Shakespeare said, well, yes, I need to talk to him. We've had a bit of an argument, actually. And Ben said, oh, no, Shakespeare, not again. What happened? And Shakespeare said, no time. Need to find him. Ben Johnson said, suit yourself. Anyway, when you find him, tell him to come to mine. I'll be waiting for him. And Shakespeare said, well, obviously not. I like him too. Why would I tell? No. And Ben said, all right, don't get all weird about it, Shakespeare. May the best man win. And Ben Johnson hobbled off down the cobbled streets. You might wonder why he was hobbling. Well, actually, he hurt his leg earlier in the day, riding his horse around London town. Shakespeare racked his brain for where David could have gone. He thought, where do actors go when they finish shows normally? And he thought, of course, he'll be in the Swan Bar and Grill, furiously drinking. So Shakespeare made his way to the Swan Bar and Grill. And sure enough... In the corner, there was David. And Shakespeare said, David, I'm sorry. I just wanted you to to listen to me for once. Look, I'm jealous of your relationship with Ben. And David said, Shakespeare, you had your chance and you ruined it. Shakespeare said, I know. 
I don't know how I can make it up to you. And then, in the corner of his eye, he saw a man who was sat at a table with an easel and a canvas on it. And Shakespeare had a light bulb moment and he went, Ben, I mean, what's your name? David. And David said, see, you don't even know my name. And Shakespeare said, I'm sorry, all right, I've just saw Ben outside. And David said, you saw Ben? Oh, great, I'll probably get going then. And Shakespeare said, no, listen, let me paint you. And David said, what the hell are you talking about? And Shakespeare said, I want to paint you. I'm a painter, you know. And David said, are you? I I didn't know that about you. And Shakespeare said, well, yeah, I'm sure I can paint. And David said, well, have you painted before? Well, no, I haven't so much as lifted a brush to a canvas, but in my, my, in my mind I have. In my dreams I'm good. And David said, oh, Shakespeare, everyone's good in their dreams. And Shakespeare said, yes, well, just let me have a go. Let me have a go at it. I could be amazing. I could be the next. And he states the name of a famous painter of the period. And David said, fine. Hurry up, though. I want to go to Ben's. So Shakespeare goes over to the painter and he grabs the easel and canvas from him. And the painter says, hey, hey, what are you doing? And Shakespeare said, I'm William Shakespeare and I want to paint. And the painter goes, well, I don't care who you are. This is my stuff. And William Shakespeare says, oh, shut up. I'll probably be better than you anyway. And he grabs all the paints as well and takes them over to David. David's face is beautifully illuminated by the candlelight. And as Shakespeare picks up the brush, he looks into David's hazel eyes. He starts trying to paint them, but it comes out really, really badly. And after a few seconds of trying, he thinks, hmm, best stick to what I know. So using the paintbrush, he paints Sonnet 24. Sonnet 24. My eye has played the part of a painter and engraved your beauty on the canvas of my heart. My body is the frame that holds this image and perspective is the most skillful part of painting. Through my skilled painter's eyes can you find the true image of yourself, which in my heart is hanging. Your eyes are the windows to my heart. Now look what good our eyes have done for each other. My eyes have drawn your shape, and your eyes are windows in which to look into my own heart, where the sun delights in looking too. But though my eyes are skillful, they can only draw what they see. They can't see into your heart. Wow, I think we somehow managed to squeeze that one into the story. We shoehorned it in, even though we didn't really know what the hell he was talking about. And I'm pretty sure David doesn't know what he's talking about either. But... You'll have to come back next week to find out David's reaction. And hopefully, Sonnet 25 is a little bit simpler than Sonnet 24. Until next week, bye!